Hello, everyone. Forest Focus, as ever, joining the International Break, something a little bit different as we look at our topic in and around Nottingham Forest. With that in mind, I'm delighted to welcome Albert to the show from the Longball Football Podcast to discuss the Maranakis family investment in Rio Ave, or Rio Ave, I should say, or Rio Ave even. I'll find that out as we go along. How it's going, how a couple of players with strong forest links are going in Portugal. Uh, Albert, good to have you with us. Your brother Barney was on during the summer to talk about Jota Silva. So, um, yeah, mm. um, Barney's on paternity leave from the podcast. Is that right? Yeah, well, he's technically on paternity leave from his job. I mean, he, he could do the podcast if he chose to, but I think he's uh, he's got more important things to be doing. <laughs> well, good to have you with us. I mean, tell us a little bit uh, about about the podcast. It's the two of you. Are you the, I don't want to say driving force, but are you the one who started it because you, you're learning Portuguese, you've been out to Portugal, is that how it works? Well, it's, fun, it's funny you should say that because I, actually Barney was, that's correct, but Barney was the one who really had the idea to start the podcast. I, I guess I was the one who kind of brought Portuguese football into the into the equation really you know me, me and Barney obviously brothers and, and big football fans and I was getting really into Portuguese football from spending some time there and, and watching games and, and learning the language and getting to know the league and stuff and um, I was always sending Barney texts of like all the crazy things that happen in Portugal and all the interesting players that we get to see and it kind of just blossomed from there but Barney really actually was the one who decided to start the podcast and four or five years later now here we are still doing it so um so yeah, it's been it's been a very much a joint effort. Yeah, well, it's good to have you with us. You pass Barney passed with flying colours on Jota Silva because <laughs> he's been great. I mean, actually, we'll we'll, we'll we'll talk about Rio Ave, and I didn't ask. This wasn't on my notes, but are you surprised at how well Jota's done? Forest fans love him. Well, I'm really glad to hear that. Um, I wouldn't say surprised, no, because I always thought he had great ability. I, I I guess the one thing you always have in the back of your mind whenever a player like that goes to to the Premier League, because you know we see kind of top top players from from the Benfica Porto and Sporting going to top clubs and, and you always feel confident about those players but you know there are there are these players like Jota Silva who who me and Barney have watched for a long time who we always think have the ability um, but there is always that question mark in the back of your mind you think would I be able to adapt you know did we get it wrong maybe the league's just too easy and and, and we, we we gave them too much credit but um, so that you know, you always have those question marks, but it's it's really great to see that that Forest fans are taking to him because he was um, a really really wonderful player to watch, and and um, I'm sure um, I don't want to cover ground that Barney already covered, but you know, a player that we we really liked because he had he had a, a unique story in Portugal. You know, he he never played for one of the big clubs. So many players go through the academies of the big clubs, and you know, he really came came through a different way playing at, at smaller teams, and so to make it to the Premier League. Um, yeah, it's it's really gratifying to see him to see him do well, and he's a top player. He, he's he's really talented. So hopefully he uh, he keeps going. I was watching match of the day two last night, and I saw you know in the dying seconds of of the game against Chelsea when he has the the chance to win it, and I, you know it wasn't even live, and I was always up on my feet, willing the ball to go in. So so yeah, really pleased to see him doing well. It's interesting that you say about. I hadn't thought about this until you just said it about his route to the top. He looks like a player who hasn't been coached to death in a good way. Like a lot yep. of young players that come through now, he's quite off the cuff. Um, but you could, but that, that, I think that infectious enthusiasm is what Forest fans love to go with the quality. So yeah, it's interesting you, you say that. Certainly, um, Rio is it Rio Ave, Rio Ave, Rio Ave? How, how am I saying it? I, I believe it's Rio Ave. As I was saying to you before, before we started recording, Portuguese people love to take as many syllables off their words as possible. So if in doubt, cut it short, and and you're probably on the right track. Excellent, excellent. Tell us a bit about them. Again, before we start recording, you told me you've been out to see them a few times. So um, yeah. tell us about the club a little bit. Well, do you know what? It's 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 a really before I get into history, it's just a really nice club. And actually, when we do get a lot of people sort of sending us messages saying, "Oh, you know, I'm going to Portugal. What do you recommend? I, you know, do you recommend any games I go to?" And I do end up recommending Rio Ave as a as a team to go and visit quite often because it's. Well, it's very easy. it's very nicely located, close to Portugal, on public transport. It's very easy to get to, but it's a really nice part of the country. It's kind of on the coast, just north of Portugal, in Vila de Conch, a really nice part of the world, um, and a really nice, really nice kind of little stadium. It's it's got one stand, which is quite uh, quite interesting. It's you know I think their attendance is very sort of around the the thousand mark um every game but really nice fan base and really nice people at the club um and it does seem to have good local support which is not always a, a guarantee in portugal um but that's a different discussion but no it's a really nice club and um obviously i know about them from recent years i did i did do a quick bit of digging just to look at their their history it does seem to be that they they've been since their um 
as since their existence kind of a, a fairly stable first and second division club um that kind of level they're not they're not a club that's really gone down to the districts or or that kind of thing which which some of the teams have um in the last sort of in their sort of more recent modern history they have had actually uh, a fair amount of success um most notably under Forest's current manager Nuno Spiritosanto who had great success as the manager of, of Rio Ave um he took them to and I couldn't believe this because I didn't watch it at the time but he took them to two cup finals in the same season in the two biggest tournaments in Portugal he took them to the final of the Taça de Portugal which is like the FA Cup the biggest cup competition in Portugal and the Taça de Liga they lost unfortunately to Benfica in both of those games which is understandable but that did see them qualify for the Europa League um and that's not the last time that that they've qualified for Europe. They did also get to the Europa League qualifiers under, um, I'm sure a few of the listeners will be aware of Carlos Carvajal. He'd been managed in England for a while, Swansea, uh, Sheffield Wednesday, I believe. Mm-hmm. Uh, maybe one other club in, in, in England. So he's been he's been around a bit and, and they got to the Europa, qu- Europa League qualifiers and they played AC Milan um, in the final qualifying round of the Europa League in what is still probably one of the most amazing games in modern Portuguese history in the last 10, 15 years. Um, they played, like I said, in, in their home stadium with one stand, the, the great AC Milan team, and, and they had this incredible penalty shootout where I think both goalkeepers took penalties and then they went round again and all this kind of stuff. And unfortunately, they did lose, but you know they got so close to the Europa League group stages. Um, and interestingly, that same season, because obviously they qualified the season before, but the season when the, quali- the Europa League qualifiers took place, um, they were relegated at the end of the season. And that, they really are kind of a good example of, of what we've seen quite a lot in the last 10, 15 years in Portugal of um, clubs trying to trying to improve their status, trying to kind of crack the, the kind of top five, top six, stake a claim to being you know a bit better than, than the rest of the pack. Um, coming close, but often, unfortunately, not succeeding. I mean, I'm not sure how aware uh, your list, your viewers will be of the kind of dynamics of Portuguese football, but there's very much an established dominance in Portugal. Of, of course, top three clubs, which, you, which we know very much about. But even outside of that, you know, Braga have really done great work to establish himself as the fourth biggest club in Portugal over the last 20 years. And then you have Vitória de Guimarães, who have had their issues, but are kind of the, the fifth biggest club essentially I mean their fans will say they're the fourth but I'll I'll leave that to them to argue out Um, but it is quite hard for any other club really to to establish any kind of consistent position um, in that kind of top five or six especially when there's been six European spots available we've seen so many times a club have a great season um, finish sixth get to the kind of Europa League or Europa Conference League qualifiers but it all falls apart they find it so hard to keep players and managers and, and remain consistent and and um, Rio Ave have, have definitely been an example of that, I think, a couple of times. Um, they've had some great players in recent years. They had, they had Medi Taremi. They brought Medi Taremi to Europe, uh, mm-hmm. Iranian striker who now plays for Inter Milan. Um, they were the club who, 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 where Fabio Quentrell started his career. And um, they've, they've had some other great players, including under Nuno, when they had a goalkeeper by the name of Edison, who obviously has gone on to do great things, and a Slovenian backup goalkeeper, um, called Jan Oblak, which was a very strange situation in Portugal to have those two players at the same time under a great goalkeeper himself in Nuno. So yeah, that's kind of a potted history of their their position in Portugal at the moment. Um, they obviously now are back in the Premier League after that relegation. They were uh, promoted as winners of the second division under their current manager, Luis Ferreira. Um, and here we are a, a couple of years later with, with Maranakis as the owner um, and, and exciting things happening, on, at least on paper, definitely. So it's interesting that like, I can see why they'd invest, uh, but the attendances struck me and the, the, the ground struck me. So uh, were you surprised yeah. when they invested in them or is there some is there some, some underlying reasons that make Rio have a good investment, do you think? Well, to be totally honest, there's, there's, there's fairly slim pickings in Portugal. Like I said, unless you're very, very wealthy and you're going to invest in Benfica or, or Porto or something like that, then there's not that many options. I mean, Braga, who are definitely the fourth biggest club and have you know a nice big stadium and they qualify for Europe pretty much every season and they have lots of good players. You know they were invested in by the owners of of PSG and and, and that was that was a kind of level of investment that they got. So if you're not quite at that level, there's there's not a lot of clubs that you would really point to and say this is a sleeping giant 
um, that that it makes sense to invest in in a way that there are quite a lot of clubs in Europe and probably Maranakis would say you saw in a club like Forest. You know, I mean, so, you know, I say a, a, an average attendance of around a thousand. It's actually not bad for, for Portugal and they do have quite a loyal fan base and it is a small area that they represent. So the, the catchment area is quite small and, and the number of fans that they can really attract, it's fairly limited. But that's the same for pretty much every club outside of those top four or five clubs that I mentioned in Portugal at the moment. So, yeah, there's not really many obvious candidates for, for clubs to invest in that, that that you can build up. I mean, some of the, the more obvious examples um, would be clubs like Bavista, the other, the other club in Porto, other than FC Porto, who have investment from um, the owner of Bordeaux. And if, if you're aware of what happened to Bordeaux recently, that's a very difficult situation. So that's not gone very well. And then you know there are there are clubs like Osmanlens who had uh, the other the only other team other than Boavista to win a Premier League title in the history of the Premier League, other than Benfica, Porto, and Sporting. So you could look at them, but they've had their, their own serious financial issues and and are currently in the third division and struggling to get up to the second. So there's not that many standout candidates, and there's not some club with this dormant fan base where they can fill a ten thousand seat in the stadium. Really, I mean, if you if you put a lot of time and effort into some of these clubs, you could possibly build that. But Rio Ave is certainly as good a club as any at this point to to invest in, given its proximity to a major city. Um, it has got a little fan base and it has had recent success. So um, clearly there are definitely some foundations there to build on. Yeah, it sounds like it. It sounds like it. So the Maranakis family have invested. They bought 80% of the club, basically, promised to invest in infrastructure on the squad. I think Miltos Maranakis... He's quite involved in it, Evangelos's son, obviously. Mm -hmm. um, I was looking at how it's gone, literally just in terms of results and the table. And I think, uh, uh, you know, they've got eight points from eight games. They're 12th in the league. I did look at mm -hmm. the fixtures. They play some tough games by the start. Exactly, so, yes. So how, how's it gone thus far? Pretty good. Um, yeah, not too not too bad. Like you say, they had some tough fixtures. So in eight games, they've already played Porto, Sporting and Braga, which is going to be very difficult for a club of rear outside to get any anything out of those games. They did put in a very good performance against Porto and they were maybe unlucky not to get a point out of the game, but 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 they didn't. And and so it was three losses in, in those games and um, I think it's now three draws and, and two wins or two, excuse me, two two draws and two wins since then, something like that. So, you know, they're doing okay. I mean, this is really a club to be judged, not in their performances against the big clubs, which have been decent, but, you know, they've struggled to get the results. This is a club where you, you judge them against their performances against teams in and around them. And um, certainly uh, in the in the early stage of the season, there's been a lot of promise. Um, there's been some, there's been some, some good, good performances and, and good football played but um, definitely there's a sense uh, and I'm sure we'll come on to this that this is a club in transition because there has been a big turnover of players um, certainly uh, there's some uh, similarly to, to the club itself the the squad and, and the coaching staff has some good foundations in a good manager in Luis Freo who I think a lot of people fancy as a good young manager in this league and did excellent work one to get them promoted from the second division as league champions and two in their first season in the Premier League they were un under a transfer embargo which means meant they couldn't sign any players and he did a really good job to to have a very solid season so um, so yeah it's been it's been it's been pretty good I mean there was a bit of excitement I mean maybe I People like myself got a bit carried away with some of the players that they were bringing in, and we thought, oh, you know, maybe they'll be high flyers this season, dark horses, and they still might be. But um, yeah, it's been it's been decent. It's been it's been pretty solid. So obviously, there's some Forest players I'll ask you about, but are they the standout players? Who who else is in the squad that you like the look of? Um, well, certainly. Um... Richards has, has made an impact, which is good. Um, I'm sure we'll talk about him more. But yeah, they they so their their summer was a very very active one. They signed, I believe, 22 players, which sounds um, astounding. Really, it's worth caveating that with the fact that they they let go 16, so they had this to is, sign. This is very this is very sorry to interject. This is very <laughs> Forest after promotion by the sound of it. I did I did make that connection myself as well. <laughs> um, so there is a certain similar certain similarity, but um, it's not just about the fact that they signed a lot of players, but they have signed a lot of very interesting players and spent money spent money, which has been quite interesting. They they spent 1.6 million euros on an attacking midfielder, Oli Pullman from Borussia Dortmund. 
Um, they spent a further 1.1 million on a, on a winger from San Lorenzo in Argentina. Um, they signed some players with proven pedigree in Portugal. They signed a, a Brazilian striker called Clayton, who had been in the Portuguese league for uh, a couple of seasons before that and, and done well. Um, they signed a very exciting um, winger called Thiago Moray, who did very well as a, as a young player at Bovista and was then signed by Lille in France and, and was very highly rated. And I think it was a bit of a coup to get him back on loan because certainly he was you know, someone looking to kick on his career in Ligue 1. Um, and I think it is a, a good signing to bring him back and he and he's looked excellent. So they spent 6 million euros in the transfer market. Now, to anyone who follows Premier League football, that will seem like peanuts, but it is worth stressing that that is actually significant investment for a club in Portugal outside of the top top five or six you know Braga will spend more than that Vittoria might spend that kind of amount of money if they make sales so for real I have to spend six million euros and this is according to transfer mark so you can take it with a pinch of salt but around that amount of money on on signings as well as what I'm sure will, will be increased wages and some of the free agents that they got maybe from Olympiacos and some of the loans that they're getting from the Premier League you know those will be wages that are higher than they're used to spending so there has been um has been significant investment, which is, um, yeah, the the impact of Maranakis has been pretty much instantaneous, and it's been a big it's been a big change for Real because, like I said, the season before they had a, they had a transfer ban, and then they did, were able to sign players in January last year, which they did without Maranakis's investment. But then this summer, with the investment, it has been noticeable that there's been um, a step up in in the recruitment, definitely. The, the Maranakis family, Evangelos Maranakis, really, is, is uh, in particular, is like very prominent in Greek football. Really dominates the scene there. He, he's becoming more prominent in English football in the terms that he, he gets headlines and um, Forest fans love him. <laughs> um, you know, he's made a huge impact on the club in the, the you know in the most recent years getting into the Premier League. Has there been an impact on Portuguese football, or is it too early days and he's more of an unknown quantity? In terms of him as a personality, well, the, you'd be surprised to hear there's actually been very little national media coverage of this whole situation, <laughs> which is more of a comment on the state of the Portuguese sports media, which is completely and utterly dominated by coverage of the top three clubs in Portugal, which is strange because this, in my opinion, has been a very big development over the summer, but you wouldn't, you wouldn't know that if you watch the main... Portuguese sports channels or read the main Portuguese newspapers who I mean I, I don't read them regularly but there's been little to no coverage of this of this takeover and the impact of the new owners from where I've maybe in passing um, there has of course been more coverage by sort of more independent journalists and pe people like ourselves who are more interested in the stories from the rest of the league and I think those kind of people are looking at it in a fairly positive way and seeing it as a as a positive investment in the league. I think it's important to know that um, people are very keen for investment into Portuguese football because it, it's not particularly invested in and there is a growing disparity between the, the clubs with means and the rest of the league. So the idea that there's now a club with more financial might behind them is seen as a as a, by by most people as a positive for the league in general to to grow the quality of the league. In terms of who the owner is and how people see him i think i think this could be it's probably quite good for marinakis's image perhaps because people aren't really looking at him going oh there's a crazy owner taking over what's he going to do with the club it's going to be a disaster people are sort of going well it's just quite good you know there's money coming into the league and there's money coming into a, a small team which most people are taking as a positive so this is a wider question on the portuguese league is it viewed internally then as as a feeder league or is it not viewed because like, you look at like they signed uh, sporting signed Jokerez and now he's one of the highest properties in Europe mm. is there just an acceptance that he'll stay for two seasons and then he'll go or do Portuguese clubs think they can build and challenge and you know up, up the profile of the league in time I think it's been seen as a real coup that he's even here for the second season to be totally mm. honest with you that's that's where the Portuguese league is very much a feeder league and everybody understands that that's part of part of how it works I mean you always find um, fans mainly of the big clubs with that kind of exasperation saying oh they'd leave too quickly they should they should stay with us for longer and establish themselves and get a bigger move but you know when you've got and I use this as an example perhaps a slightly outdated example when you've got Enzo Fernandes joining from South America for 13 million euros at Benfica and then leaving six months later for almost 10 times that figure 
it's kind of understandable that, that this is a feeder league. Although I think it's fair to say the Portuguese league is quite reactive because the the market changes very quickly. I think a lot of people don't really, really understand that the, the transfer market, the global transfer market can change very quickly from one transfer window to another. And so this window really has been one where um, it's been about who didn't leave. And Victor Jokic is a great example of that. Perhaps if Victor Jokic had, had joined three years ago at, at Sporting and had the season that he had, he would have left um, 12 months later. But the market's kind of changed. There aren't really those clubs put pulling 100 million euros out of their pocket for a player. It doesn't seem to be happening these days. So, yeah, Portuguese league is quite reactive. You know, Sporting are very happy to keep Jokic. I mean, they probably do expect to sell him next year. And equally with their manager, Ruben Amarim, who is linked with a lot of clubs, because it's not just a place for players to develop and move on. It's a place for managers to do the same. And I think Amarim was seen as another person who would, who would do that. But the same thing happened. You know, he spoke to clubs fairly openly. And it didn't happen. So I think, you know, in general, it's absolutely a feeder league. You know, one or two years for the top players is is kind of uh, expected and, and for the top managers. But I think maybe perhaps some with the with the smaller clubs, um, it's interesting because, for, for example, a club like Rio Ave, you know, there's... And I, I could use, for example, Medi Taremi as, as another, as an example again of a player who... He was the joint st- top scorer in Portugal for Rio Ave. He didn't need to go to Porto to to reach the the top levels that he did. He had already kind of achieved those levels, but he didn't get the move to big clubs. So for the smaller clubs, it's more about can they move players on to a bigger club in Portugal? Or if that player is going to leave, it's probably going to be to somewhere like the Middle East or Turkey or a more obscure country in Europe. It's not necessarily those players who are going to move on to the bigger clubs in Europe. So there's various dynamics in Portugal. I think the, the where we're at at the moment is um, the big clubs are bringing in players from abroad more, definitely. They're kind of seeing that there's value to be had in bringing players maybe in from from Europe. And even Jokeres, who came in from Coventry for 20 million euros, which was not a small fee, but that was kind of seen as, as good value. And, and the, top, the best players in the league at the moment, off the top of my head, have been brought in from places like... Uh, Italy or, or we have, we've got Danish players doing very well and players who've come in from Belgium and stuff like that so um, so yeah it's, it's, it's always changing but in general it is about bringing players in developing them and selling them off so the Jota deal that we did bucked the trend really because he didn't have that move to <laughs> yeah. the, the top Portuguese club yeah that is a good example of of that happening and it's a funny thing because a lot of people like myself have been calling for it for years saying to clubs like Nottingham Forest look there are bargains to be had in in the Portuguese league but it seemed like clubs the big clubs around Europe were waiting for those players to go to the top clubs in the Premier League but then they're having to pay four or five times the price for the players once they do well at a club like Benfica in the Champions League whereas you could go straight to the source and pick up the players from there and Jota Silva was absolutely linked with all three of the top clubs in Portugal but there is perhaps a bit more savviness now that you can go direct to the source, which I think is probably a good thing for the smaller clubs. Hopefully, we'll bring about a bit more of a democratic transfer market in Portugal, which has been so dominated by the big clubs. But yeah, that's a fairly um, new phenomenon. It's not; it's still not something we're seeing every transfer window, but it was very, very welcome. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I remember we did sign players from Portugal with very mixed results. We signed João Carvalho from Benfica, most sure. one of the most divisive players in terms of how he was viewed um <laughs> Gil Diaz or Gil Diaz I'm not sure how you say that and also one who was good who didn't come from one of those clubs I remember he only stayed for a season was Thiago Silva who I think came from is it Ferenc or Femenlik ah, okay. or some, something like that this was about right. about eight years ago now or something but he was a good attacking midfielder but uh, yeah we've right. had we've had some mixtures on Cafu was another one who we got from Olympiacos a defensive right. midfielder okay uh, but yeah interesting signings right just before um, I, I ask Albert about uh, Richards and the the Forest connection just a quick word about the Leicester City game I really stuffed this uh, advert up the other day so I'll just try and do a better <laughs> job of it uh, so as you can see on the screen I'll put it up again right it is on uh, the 25th of October uh, Leicester v Forest happy hour all night 30% off all draft beers three Pound cascales, what a bargain! Game inside, it's on the two outdoor screens, chippy to eat till 9 pm with all dishes, eight pound fifty. The barbecue and the courtyard pizza kitchen. Oh, I mentioned pizzas. Anyway, any guest who comes on, uh, and we mentioned pizzas in the advert, have to tell us what their favorite pizza is. I'm just putting you on the spot, Albert. 
No, no, no. I'm well prepared for this question because when oh, Barney good. came on, he texted me immediately <laughs> afterwards and said he wasn't happy with his answer. He felt oh, nice. Because he, he, said, he said margarita, which is obviously the most boring choice, although a great choice. So I'm going to try and say something more interesting. I'll try. I mean, I do love a calzone. That's, oh, yeah. you know, nice. of any kind. So, yeah, I do that. Excellent. Excellent. Right. Back to the, the forest connection. Then I did forget that Jonathan Panzo went there as well. So I don't know if you've researched him or not, but we'll start with yep. Omar Richards, who um, you mentioned and made an impact. I saw a few tweets saying he was doing well. So, so he stood out in, in general, has he? Yeah, I think he he made a fairly instant impact actually. Um I didn't I didn't watch his first game live, but I watched the highlights and I watched the first game that he really caught my eye, I think was maybe his second game. Um where I've played out a two two draw against Estriel. And straight away I thought he, he was really impressive and I was quite surprised because I didn't really know what to expect from him. I hadn't really followed his career before, so I didn't know anything about him. But he did stand out straight away, very attacking player. And surprisingly creative. I, I, I mean, I, I'd, I'd be, I'd encourage um, anyone who's interested to see how he's doing at Rio Ave to go and go and watch the highlights of the game Rio Ave two, Estoril two, um, because he's he's featured a lot because he was involved a lot in the game, um, and he was really creative player. He did get an assist in the game, but also created multiple chances. And I remember looking at him, thinking, I think he's a really interesting player, and, and he did look at to be a very high level. The interesting thing about that game, of course, was Rio Ave took a 2-0 lead. They did then concede two goals and only took a draw from the game. And at the time, Estoril were really struggling. I mean, they're still struggling now, but at the time, they were they were really struggling. So I think that was probably seen as a bit of a slip-up. And perhaps there were one or two times, if you're being critical, you could have looked and said, well, Richards perhaps wasn't that great defensively for a couple of the actions that led to goals. So that was an interesting game to look at him in because, you know, you did see, a, you know, a brief picture of a player who, who was clearly very technically gifted, very capable, especially from an attacking point of view, but perhaps had some, you know, perhaps he had uh, had some m to be more disciplined defensively, but, you know, maybe that one, that game wasn't particularly representative of who he is as a player. Um, he's continued to put in good performances and um, I did speak to my friend Felipe Mello on our podcast recently and he was, he was saying he looks like a really good player for this level and I, I do agree with that. I think um, it's going to be interesting to see how he plays over the full season because if he can stand out in the Premier League, I think that'd be a really, really good thing for his career. And I think he's got um, he's got a real opportunity to do that because you know he's not going to be playing Benfica every week. He's not going to be playing Sporting every week where he's got a track fit to his his runs. Most of the time, he's gonna he's going to be playing teams who, at best, are around Rio Ave's level. So there is going to be a real opportunity for him to 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 stand out. And as Rio Ave as a team, kind of gel more and get more consistency in the team performances i think it could be a really good platform for him to to stand out or at least that's the the early indications yeah i'll just i'll ask you one more question i'll check how long's left on his contract um this is difficult to answer i mean his career is floundered because of injuries not so much mm. talent if he has a blinding season and stays fit can you see uh someone who could this is difficult to answer go back to the premier league with forest or at worst Get a big move for money that make you know that makes Forest money to maybe a, a big club in Portugal or or Europe or Saudi or something like that. Potentially, yeah, potentially. I guess the the only question would be how if you were looking to sell him, how would clubs judge the standard of the league, and therefore, was it easy? Was it a good enough picture? You know, could you build a good enough picture of him as as a player from playing in the Premier League? I would argue yes. Um, and I think um, it would be really interesting to see him go back at Forest, although the, the Premier League is a, is a very big jump and not every player makes that jump, even if they are they do have ability. That said, I mean, I can definitely see him going down the European route. I think um, a lot of players, you know, obviously he's an English player. We don't see English players in Portugal very often and English players don't go abroad that often. It is happening more. And I think there is um, there are opportunities for English players in Europe, perhaps more than they think, and it can be uh, a good option if you know if you prove yourself, for example, as he is doing on on in a loan spell in Portugal. Um, there could be good opportunities in in Greece, in France, in Italy, in all those kind of, in kind of leagues where you, where you can do well. So. Um, yeah, I mean, I've only watched a few games of his, so it's really hard to know whether he he'll play in the, in the Premier League. You know, I, I would love him to do so, um, but definitely, if he has a good season, I think you know Portugal is is a good place to build a career playing in Europe. Definitely, and it, it can be a really good option for for a player like 
like Richards, who perhaps isn't isn't going to be playing in the Premier League. Uh, it contracts till 2026 for people who, who are listening. So he's got two years left. So it'll be interesting to see what happens uh, this summer, certainly. You mentioned how do people judge the Premier League. I asked you, uh, the Portuguese, and I asked your brother this. So um, interested to know, is it on a par with, I don't know, the Greek League, uh, the Scottish League, the top end of the Championship, the lower end of the Premier League? I'm throwing lots of leagues at you here. Where would you pitch the Portuguese League? Well, it's quite... Um... There's a big disparity within the league. So even within the league itself, I mean, Benfica, Porto and Sporting, definitely I would put them as clubs that would would fight for the top six in the Premier League. I mean, Sporting with the team that they've assembled this season and the players that they've got, you could, I would say they'd probably be fighting to be a top four team in, in the Premier League. Um, and then Brago, who play in the Europa League regularly, could probably be uh, could probably handle themselves as, as a Premier League team as well, definitely. Um, but then after that, the, the standard does drop off quite a lot, and I would say it's probably not unfair to describe the rest of the teams as as Championship level sides. Probably, um, I think that's and I think that's fairly accurate. And I, I'm sure, yeah, people at home will be able to get what I mean when I say, you know, decent Championship sides. Uh, the other two players are um, Jonathan Panzo and Brandon Aguilera. Panzo went on loan. I mean, I have to be honest with you, I forgot that he'd even gone because he's not <laughs> featured for Forest. If, poor guy, you know, he arrives from Monaco. He's had a good youth career at Chelsea and he's just he's just had a lot of bad luck at Forest through circumstance and um, us getting promoted to the Premier League and signing a load of players, uh, you know, underneath him in a sense. So have you seen much of him yet or not? Yeah, he's been playing, um, which I'm which I'm pleased to see. Um, yeah, when 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 Jonathan Panzo signed, um, I was in two minds because on the one hand, you know, as an English guy doing a podcast about the Premier League, it's always exciting to have English players, and I was aware of his pedigree, you know, from his youth team days, and also from he's played it for England at youth level, so clearly he's a exciting player. But then on the other hand, it was a slightly strange move, and I, and I was perhaps thinking. Is this a move that's best for the player's career or is this just the first example that we might see more of of how the owner might want to use Rio Ave as a club, maybe convenient place to move on players when you need to free up squad spaces and, and all that kind of thing. I was in two minds on that. And and so, you know, in the first couple of games of the season, I was keen to keep an eye out for him and see how he did or see if he was used. Um, and he, he has been used recently and it is pleasing to see because, you know, he could kind of look at his situation and go, well, this is not really where I imagined I would be when I signed for Forest, or you know, when I was, I think he, I think he won silverware with the England youth national team. So mm. maybe he would look at it and go, you know, in three, four years' time, this isn't exactly where I man- imagined I'd be. But he does seem to be up for the challenge, and and he started recently and played really well, and in the system that um, that Rio have a play, where he's playing on the same side as Richards, you know, he plays on the left side of defence, and Richard plays obviously as more of an attacking fullback. He's he's been very involved in games as well, and he does seem pretty comfortable at this level. Um, and I would really, really like to see him um, play regularly in this team, play regularly in the Premier League, build up some confidence, and you know have an opportunity to show that. I think from you know what we know of his background, if he can play consistently in the league, I think he could really prove that he's got great quality because it is a good place for defenders, in my opinion, to. To show their quality, I think as a defender you can stand out in the in the Portuguese league in a way that perhaps you can't do maybe if you went if you went on loan to the Championship or something like that. Um, so I think it can be can be a really good opportunity for him, and I do think the early signs are good because he's put in very good performance. He's got a very experienced player alongside him, Adelan Santos, the club captain, who has played there for a long time. He he, he uh, played in the Europa League qualifiers. He got relegated with them. He came back up with them. So you know he's in a he's in a good he's in a good back four, I think. And yeah, I, I really hope it's a, it's a good opportunity for him. I'd love to see him do well, really. And I do think he's done well in the first few games. Um, the other one's Brandon Aguilera, who was threatening to break through at Forest last season. He had a loan at Bristol Rovers. He had a good Copper America, and then we we sold him to Rio Ave. Um, Rio Ave for. Yeah, I think quite good money. I don't know the exact figure, but I think it was one of it might have been a funky PSR deal. So, um, but um, a talented player, young player. Uh, any, any insights on him? He hasn't featured as much from what I was looking up. He, he's been more of a sub. Well, this is the interesting thing because I think he was probably the player that maybe most people were most excited about of the kind of forest signings. Actually, I've not 
he's the player I've kind of seen least of. As you said, he did start two games, and I think he's come on as a sub in all the other games. But he, he I mean, he hasn't. If I'm being totally honest, he hasn't really caught the eye totally. I mean, I think maybe it's difficult for him because for uh, really, I've did sign a lot of attacking players, and a lot of the play, attacking players that they've signed are kind of more Premier League proven. And so perhaps they've settled in quicker, and I think perhaps the manager maybe trusts them more. I think the thing with uh, is it Aguilar? Sorry, I think I think the the um the thing with him will be it might take him longer to make an impact, um because I think he's probably the least experienced of all of the players signed from Forest, and I think he's probably got the most to do to to kind of gain the manager's trust. That said, it could still all go to plan, and and if he does get a run of games and start performing, then then it could be great for him. But yeah, as of yet, he's definitely kind of been been made the least impact excellent uh, good stuff really interesting if people have liked uh, this uh, do us a favor and hit like uh, and do subscribe to the youtube channel give us a lovely review on itunes and spotify and you can of course become a channel member very much appreciate any support on that front um where can people find more of you if they're interested in uh, hearing more about portuguese football well, uh, we our podcast is hopefully everywhere. So wherever you usually listen to podcasts, it's, it's audio only, so there's no video. But if you if you search up long ball football, um, and that's football spelled the Portuguese way, I'm sure it'll be in the description or title of this uh, podcast if you need to copy and paste it. But yeah, if you search that up, we should pop up. We're also on Twitter, uh, which we use fairly regularly. Um, and there is an Instagram account as well, slightly less regularly updated, but... Um, but yeah, but yeah, we should we should be pretty much everywhere that people want to find us. And yeah, I always um, rather than trying to self promote, the thing I always use try and do in these situations is just try and give a little plug to Portuguese football in general because it is a really fun league to watch. Um, and you know, there's loads of great players, interesting players that some of whom we've discussed today. And um, yeah, there's loads of good stuff happening. You can watch games on UK TV as well. There's a, uh, a site called Triller TV. You've, you've got games if you want to watch them. And yeah, it's 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 good fun. It's good fun. What's it called? Triller TV. I don't know that one. Yes, they. It's quite funny. They um. It's, it used to be called Fight TV, and they mainly did combat sports, MMA, uh, okay. and wrestling. Yeah. I've and then the that, first yeah. sporting thing that they picked up was the Portuguese league, which perhaps kind of gave you an indication of the reputation that the Portuguese league had. <laughs> but <laughs> but they uh they've been really good and they've stuck by it. So yeah, if you if you head over there, there's three games a week: Sporting, Benfica, and Porto. And, yeah, sporting definitely worth watching this season for sure. Good stuff, good stuff. Uh, thanks very much to Albert, and hopefully people enjoy. So, like I say, do hit like on the video. We'll be back uh, later in the week with uh, hopefully an interview, a good interview uh, with another guest, and then we'll probably do a phone in uh, on Thursday uh, or, or Friday potentially. So, yeah, have a good day, everyone. We don't see you tomorrow. We shall hopefully see you soon. <laughs>